This is Chris Hargraves, and this is the Tips for Lawyers podcast, episode 41. This is, of course, the third of three in my series on persuasion, and we are going to get into some more practical strategies of preparing a persuasive argument. And now that I've gone through some of the more fundamental uh, preparatory material in episodes one and two, as always, show notes can be found at the Tips for Lawyers website at tipsforlawyers.com slash podcast slash 41. And I will link up as well to that, if you haven't listened to them already, episodes 40 and 39, which deal with some of the issues I think you really need to get to grips with as an overarching principle associated with how you are going to be persuasive. Because persuasion is not just about using the right arguments, and it's not just about crafting clever language or having hard-hitting, uh, aggressive approaches to things. Persuasion is a more subtle form of of getting people to want the same thing that you want. And that often involves a lot more than simply beating people over the head uh, with your opinion until they get sick of arguing with you. So, quick recap. In the first persuasion series in episode 39, what we took a look at was the ways in which persuasion could be used. We had a look at the various uh, categories of persuasion. We had a bit of a talk about the areas in which you might need to be persuasive within a legal practice. And I provided some uh, outlines there of some circumstances in which you might find yourself needing to be persuasive, both with your colleagues, uh, with other parties, with judges, and really all things in between. The next episode, episode 40 in session number two on persuasion, what I talked about was uh, knowing your enemy, for lack of a better word. Now, not everyone on the other side of a persuasive discussion is your enemy, but I had to talk about the critical need to understand where the other participant in your persuasive exercise is coming from in order to maximize your ability to address particular hurdles that are going to come up. And understanding them as best you can, and it's not always completely possible, but understanding them is going to be a great way of actually advancing your ability to be persuasive, or at the very least getting to a point of knowing that you're never going to get anywhere. And today what I wanted to do is just outline in fairly big picture form, uh, because it is a highly variable topic, how to craft a persuasive argument. So this could in fact apply to any number of circumstances. It could apply to a uh, spoken word. It could apply to a piece of legal writing that you need to do. You might be giving a presentation. And in fact, you'll probably notice some similarities here between uh, the information I've got on Tips for Lawyers about preparing for a presentation and the information I'm going to give you now about being persuasive, because they are very similar if you think about it in that context. Giving a presentation, you are, generally speaking, trying to communicate a particular point and therefore, the steps that you will take to build an effective presentation are going to be very similar to those where you are trying to craft a persuasive argument. So, where do we start in persuasion? Well, I think really the most fundamental thing you need to get straight in your head is precisely what it is you are trying to persuade the other person of. And this sounds like a simple step, but it is in fact slightly more convoluted than what you might believe because I do see a lot of letters and certainly I see a lot of advocacy where I'm not totally convinced that the advocate understands precisely what it is they're trying to persuade the other side or the court of. Similarly, in letter writing, we use a lot of words and we have long sentences and we use terms of art, but I'm not always sure we've entirely sat back and gone, what is the point of this correspondence? Is it simply to say some stuff or is it to, in fact, try to engender change of some sort in the thought patterns of the recipient. So it can be more subtle and it can get quite complicated because there may not be, for example, a single point. If you are trying to create the point that your client rejects an offer and you are trying to give the impression that uh, your client is very firmly rejecting the offer, it's pretty straightforward. You go, dear sir, our client rejects your offer, full stop yours faithfully. So that was pretty easy, wasn't it? And that will communicate that point. Now, the question is, do you need more words in there? Do you need to explain why you're rejecting the offer? Is there a strategic or legal benefit towards doing so? Or does it send a better and more powerful message by simply leaving it that simple? And I should say I've done both depending on the circumstances. And as we're going to see, the circumstances sometimes warrant different approaches to things. 
The next thing, of course, is you need to be mindful of is although you may limit the effect of what you're trying to accomplish from a persuasion perspective, that is not the only perspective that you need to bring to any particular equation. You are operating within the confines of a legal system and within the confines of a legal system, there will be some things you will need to do or some things that are matters of standard practice, which you cannot get around doing, even though they might uh, detract from, uh, water down the position that you're trying to take. So uh, although there are elements of persuasion, it is not pure persuasion because we do have certain parameters placed upon us within legal practice that might change our ability to do things in a particular way. We can't get around that. If you didn't want rules and regulations, probably legal practice wasn't the best choice for a career for you. So we do need to be mindful of those as well. So that being said, I think the most fundamental points you can take away from having to choose what you're actually trying to persuade the other party of is uh, the first, limit the points. If at all humanly possible, you don't want to try and persuade someone of 10 things in one go or 15 things in one go. In an ideal world, you will be dealing with one topic and one topic alone. Why do I say that? I say that because the more topics you add in that you need to persuade someone of in a particular set of circumstances, the less likely you are to persuade them of any. Because within 10 topics, if you write a letter and it needs to deal with 10 topics, let's say, and you fail to convince them of one topic, it may be that they simply don't bother paying much attention to the other nine topics and then you get stuck. So if at all possible, Try and be persuasive about a limited number of essential topics in one go. And of course, there are complexities associated with this, particularly in negotiations, particularly where there are a raft of commercial points. But there might be benefit. Say you're in a commercial negotiation of some sort, your client's looking to buy some sort of premises, and uh, there's a raft of clauses that are causing your client issues, but there's one big ticket clause. It might be worth having an isolated piece of correspondence or an isolated telephone call to explore that particular topic without necessarily including it within the context of the others. And that way you can be uh, at your most persuasive, hopefully, on that. Now, on the flip side, having the other topics in there might also help to have a bit of give and take. You might be able to say, look, we'll agree to this, but only on the basis that for example. Now, that's a bit of a horse trade and is less to do with persuasion and more to do with commerce, but you get the point. You need to make a strategic decision about how many topics you are going to try and persuade someone of at any given time. The next thing is don't try to persuade people of things necessarily that they already agree with. Uh, I have seen in court people actually talk judges out of giving uh, favourable orders in circumstances where they just couldn't bear to shut up for long enough to actually let the judge do so. And because they insisted on talking through every single thing, they in fact ended up raising a point or bringing something up that the judge wasn't aware of previously. And in fact, they've talked the judge out of giving them a favourable order. So know when not to speak. It makes a significant difference. The next thing, of course, that limiting the topics does for you is that it gives you an opportunity to ignore irrelevant things. Uh, nothing waters down a persuasive argument by including willy-nilly anything that comes to mind at the time you're preparing the presentation or you're uh, doing your submissions or you're making numerous asides. Stay on point. The more you distract, unless it's a very strategic decision on your part, the less likely you are to actually be able to stay on the point because you will get caught up in sideways conversations. You will get distracted from what the point was you were trying to make. You will be less cohesive and the other party won't quite understand precisely what it is you're supposed to be talking about because you keep raising other issues that they need to get on with. So pick your topic, pick the number of topics, but more importantly, or at least similarly importantly, turn your mind to what ought not be included in any sort of persuasive argument. The next thing, and I think it's pretty obvious, but let's say it out loud just in case, is that you need to be prepared and you need to be accurate. And this goes for everything, whether it's a short letter or a commercial negotiation or a mediation or you're going to a court hearing, you need to be prepared and you need to be accurate because nothing is less persuasive than someone who cannot get the facts straight. If you can't say the name of your client properly, if you don't know who you're acting for, if you announce your appearance and you muddle up your client's name, aside from being 
mildly embarrassing. Um, your ignorance suggests strongly that you have no clue what you're doing and sometimes that's going to be right. Now, sometimes, of course, you just trip over your words or a particular thing comes up that you weren't prepared for. That is how these things work. But to the extent that it's up to you, you need to actually be prepared and you need to be accurate. Know what you need to know. I'm not saying you need to overwork your preparation. I'm needing to say over time you will develop a bit more of a knack for understanding exactly how much preparation is necessary. Sometimes it will be less, sometimes it will be more. It varies depending on the circumstances of the matter. The next thing I think it's worthwhile doing is revisiting then the topics that we discussed in the second of these podcast series on persuasion, and that is having a look at the characteristics of the other party. Who is it that you were trying to persuade? Is it another lawyer? Is it a lay person? Is it a businessman? Are they uh, a mum and dad small business? Are they a gigantic multinational corporation? How is their level of sophistication? How well do they understand the law in the area that you're talking about? Is it a commercial matter? Is it a legal matter? What boxes do you need to tick? But most importantly, where are they going to be coming from from their perspective? Are they going to be coming from the point of view of someone who is personally and emotionally or physically aggrieved or damaged in some way? Are they going to be coming from the point of view of a cold, hard cash-related negotiation? Are they coming from some point of legal high ground that they think their arguments are better than perhaps they are? Are they coming from a point of weakness that you can exploit in any way? Understand where they're coming from, but understand that logos, pathos, ethos, equation that I spoke about in the second episode. It will give you a better understanding of the other side, but it will help you know what points you need to address if you're going to get over any particular topic. And that will vary from person to person. It will also vary from judge to judge. It will vary from lawyer to lawyer. You will have different responses to different types of things. Some people react to emotional things better or worse. Some people react to logic better or worse. Sometimes logic will not get you anywhere at all because in the area I work in, at least, logic sometimes comes into play and sometimes it doesn't. Commercial negotiations are not always about who is right or wrong, as I'm sure you will be appreciating very quickly if you haven't already. So this is the point where you need to go, okay, I know what my argument is and I know the area well enough, but now I need to figure out how to communicate things in a way that is going to get at the pressure points that I need to get at in order to get to the position of persuasion. It doesn't matter who your recipient is, but the extent you can individualize what you say to adapt for the relevant person, the greater your opportunity will be. And in line with that, it is worth considering, and I'm not saying this is a horses, you know, this is a horses for courses situation, but it is worth considering whether there is any small concession or small win that you can make in terms of a persuasion. And I'm thinking here in particular, obviously, of a negotiation or some form of dispute. But if there is sometimes a small concession on a matter of critical importance to someone, there might be something that costs you $500 to do in order to give them uh, what they need emotionally in order to come out with a much more significant result for your client. Then consider doing that at an appropriate time. It is an element of persuasion, giving someone a small win, giving someone the ability to come out with their held head held high on a particular issue. It will potentially get you much further than simply maintaining a hard line on anything, even if you're right. And this is where the logic, emotion, dichotomy starts to come into play, which is that this is playing at the emotional level, not a logical level. Sure, you might be right. You might have a great legal case. You might have the best argument. They might have no chance at all of winning. But if on that topic that is smaller, giving away the point because it is by far their biggest bugbear in the entire thing allows you to get past that and go on to a matter of greater significance, then surely that's a worthwhile trade. The last thing I wanted to suggest in terms of this little uh, developing a persuasive argument uh, session is hit hard and hit fast. The longer you ramble, whether it be in writing or orally, the less persuasive you will be. Do not say more words than you have to. Do not say less words than you have to, but get your point across, get it across well, do what you need to do, and then be quiet. 
I mentioned before the person who took the judge out of giving them favourable orders. And you can do much the same. Make your point. Be persuasive. Embrace silence if that's what you need to. If this is something where there is talking involved, silence is not the enemy. Silence can be a wonderful thing. If you have made your point and you have nothing more to say, then say nothing more on the point until someone has had an opportunity to weigh in and create a further discussion. Likewise, in writing, if you have made your point and there is no need to labour anything further or elaborate anything, if it's well understood, if it's well crafted, if you have set out your case, if you have done it properly and you have eliminated those things that are unnecessary, then don't feel obliged for something to be longer than it has to just because it seems too short. By far and away, the most common things I cross out in letters that I'm amending for junior lawyers are things that don't add to the letter. They are things that have no strategic or legal benefit. They're simply there because they seem like they should be there. And that's not a good enough reason by and large. So hit hard and hit fast. Get your point across as I have just done. And so I don't propose to do anything more. That is persuasion. Session three of three. This has been the Tips for Lawyers podcast episode number 41. You can find the show notes and the links to things at tipsforlawyers.com slash podcast slash 41. And I would be grateful if you would head over to iTunes, go to tipsforlawyers.com slash iTunes and leave a review because it makes a big difference to me and I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'll see you next time.